All right, looks like we are good to go for today, right at 2. So um, if you have, if you're just logging in and you haven't already done so, please go ahead and check your audio. And um, if you're experiencing any audio trouble or you don't have a headset or speakers, um, you can also call in and uh, participate by phone. And I'm putting that number into the chat for anybody who um, might need that. So I'd like to welcome you all to the third webinar of the 2017 IGNIS season. We are uh, thrilled to have you join us today. IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's what we're hoping to do today is to ignite your curiosity and spark your intellect. This series is brought to you by the Office of E-Learning and Open Education at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And your hosts today are myself, Alyssa Sells and Mark Carbon, and we'll share our contact information with you at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today is Sally Halstead, and our topic is how to become, or um, actually, <laughs> that's not our topic this week. Our topic last week was how to become a culturally responsive campus. Um, our topic this week is the four connections of, um, for faculty and student success. So I'd like to give Sally a big thank you for um, joining us today to share her knowledge and expertise with us. Please note that all of our webinars are captioned this season, and I'd like to thank a la carte for their real-time captioning services. To view those captions, you can click on the CC button in the top right corner of the audio video panel, or you can use Control or Command F8 to open and Control or Command W to close the captioning window. And you can also find a list of Collaborate keyboard shortcuts located in the Help menu. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a link to those shortcuts as well if you'd like to check those out. And we also have an accessibility guide for participants, and I'm putting that link into the chat as well. As a reminder, this webinar will be recorded. You can access the recording link on the ATL blog, and I'll give you that link as well. You can also find our full schedule and uh, our webinar descriptions there as well. And we'll get the resources from the webinar and the recording posted um, within a few days after um, the webinar airs. So traditionally, we begin our webinars by running through a few of the Collaborate tools. So we'll go ahead and do that now. And then I'll turn it over to Mark to introduce Sally. And I'm going to move through these next couple of slides uh, rather quickly because um, the only feature we're really going to be using today um, is the polling tool and then um, the chat. So those are the two that we'll focus on. And then um, please feel free to type your comments and questions into the chat as we go or um, feel free to raise your hand to ask a question. So here is our meeting interface. That upper left panel is for um, audio video. The middle panel is a participant panel where you can see who all has joined us today. And then the lower left corner is the chat area where you can type questions and comments. And um, we'll help moderate those and interrupt um, Sally as she's speaking. Uh, we're not going to use that center toolbar today. And then the whiteboard space there is where you're seeing the slides right now. And then here are some participant tools. There are some emoticons that you can um, use to give smiley faces and applause. If you need to step away, feel free to mark that button. Um, if you'd like to speak um, and be called on, feel free to raise your hand. I've gone ahead and raised my hand so you can see what that looks like. It'll put you in the queue. We'll call on people in order. Um, the next tool over is the polling tool. Um, that's with the little check mark. And we will be using that today. But if you look in the panel on the left, it actually has an A in it right now because um, Sally's polls that she has set up for us today are A, B, C, D instead of a check mark for yes or no. So we will be using that tool. If you'd like to go ahead and give that a try, feel free. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and click A for you there so you can test that out. We will be using that poll uh, three or four times, I think, throughout the presentation. So make sure that you make a note of um, where that tool is and how it works. 
Um, also, if you do decide to raise your hand and you get called on to speak, please make sure that you turn your talk button on while you're speaking. And then again, please make sure you turn your talk button off when you're not speaking so we don't get any background noise. All right. Um, the last thing I have to do before I turn it over to Mark to introduce Sally is to give you a link to a handout that we are going to use later in the session. I'm going to go ahead and give that to you now. Um, you don't really need to go look at it now, but if you would like to get it opened and ready to go, um, feel free. Sally will um, direct us with what we're supposed to do with that um, a little later, and I'll put the link into the chat again when we get to that point in the webinar. All right, Mark, um, you are up to introduce Sally. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's the pleasure of introducing Sally to everybody. She comes to us from uh, Lake Washington Institute of Technology, where she is the Associate Dean of Instruction. And uh, part of she, as many of us in the system, no, wears many hats. So she's overseeing the curriculum development, the e-learning, the library learning commons, outcomes assessment, professional development, and supplemental instruction. So I think she's very busy. So thanks for spending some time with us today. <laughs> um, her favorite part of the job is working with faculty. And uh, I think a lot of us would, e would echo that as well. Uh, Sally's been at Lake Washington for over six years now and she began her time there in the TRIO program. Uh, she's taught the Social and Human Services program and in the college strategies. She currently has an MA in International Care and Community Development. Some of the more interesting parts are coming now. So when she's not at work, she loves spending time with her family and friends, um, dancing, which is incredible, the variety of ballet, jazz, lyrical, African. Um, the hiking, reading, the brewing beer part. We, we may have to talk about that later, Sally. That's very interesting. Um, and hanging out with her cats. So you have a very full and busy life. So I will uh, turn it over to you to give your presentation now. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alyssa and Mark. Uh, and I am so happy to be here with all of you um, and have this opportunity to share a little bit of what we've been doing at Lake Washington um, that we learned from a sister college in Texas, Odessa. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, and what I have to begin is a poll to get to know you all a little bit better. And so using the polling tool that Alyssa reviewed on the left-hand side of your screen above our list of names, um, go ahead and respond to the following question. What is your role at your college or organization? And the letters there are on the screen. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Excellent. OK. Let me go ahead and publish those results for you, Sally. Okay. So you Thank you so much. Yeah. There you go. Great. Oh, wonderful. OK, that's super helpful. Cool. And thank you to those who are answering the last question, or the D option. Perfect. Great. So what I hope today um, to accomplish in kind of keeping in mind what roles you have at your college is providing an overview of the framework called the Four Connections. And then we'll have an opportunity to discuss how it might look at your college and with your role. Excellent. All right, so I have one more question. Um, what part of your job gets you up and ready to go to work every, or at least most, mornings? I love Annalisa's <laughs> answer. She says all of the above. Maybe we should have added an, an E. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. OK, let's oh, give okay. everybody a chance um, to answer. I'm going to go ahead and publish those. And that timer you just heard was uh, actually the timer for Mark and I to be done. So we're oh. right on schedule. Perfect. Let's see, publish. There we go. I'll start you a new, a new timer, Sally. Great, thank you. Uh -huh. Excellent. All right, all of the above. We have more people choosing that option. Excellent, <laughs> I like that. All right. So one of the reasons I added this question is what I'm uh, going to talk about today is one of the things that gets me up in the morning and excited about.
work. Um, some of you might recognize my last name. My dad's also in the system. So we talk about work a lot, um, probably more than uh, both my partner and my mom, um, my dad's spouse, are really interested in hearing about. But we had a fantastic conversation the other day, and I said to him, I think the four connections is going to be one of the things I'm proudest of in my career. And uh, I explained to him what it was, and he said, yeah, yeah, I can see how that could get you up every morning, and sharing it with other people would be just as exciting. So thank you um, for this opportunity to just do what I love and uh, something that I looked forward to when I woke up this morning. Excellent. All right, so the purpose of this presentation and the purpose of the four connections is to empower faculty to build relationships that promote students and their own success. And really what's exciting about the four connections is that it allows us to talk about faculty and student success hand in hand in a way that uncomplicates some of the major initiatives we've been working on. So completion, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And that's what we'll be talking about today. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is from one of my mentors in the system, Peg Balakowski from Everett. And she said, you can't talk about student success without talking about faculty success. And the unfortunate thing is that we so often do. So for the next 45 minutes, um, we are going to talk about both. All right, so today what we'll do is we'll have an overview of Odessa College's development of the four connections. So I keep saying that term. We'll get to what are they, what is she actually talking about, where they came from. You'll hear stories from how we've implemented them at Lake Washington. And then we'll have a chance for discussion about how you personally can practice the four connections, what you're doing already, and what you can enhance to make it more intentional. All right. So Odessa College, um, I had the opportunity to attend a conference session presented by Don Wood, who was a dean and is now the vice president of institutional effectiveness at Odessa College. And the name of the session was faculty-student relationships and impact on, I think it was something like course retention. And it was the only session at the conference I was at that mentioned relationships. And so it was the first thing that I was drawn to. And I was really excited to walk in to a session that was focused on the thing that my heart and soul care most about as an educator, which is building meaningful relationships with students and with uh, colleagues. And so it was really exciting to see that as a, at a conference focused on completion. So I got into the session, and he kind of set up his presentation by saying that he had gotten a call when the college scorecards, which talk about completion rates and loan debt and all of that, came out from the White House a number of years ago. Um, he got a call from a news source, and they asked him why Odessa College was one of the worst colleges in the country, why they had the worst completion rates, um, why their students were graduating with ridiculous loan debt and no degrees, that sort of thing. And he didn't know the answer. He was brand new to the job at the time. So he decided to investigate what was happening. And Odessa was part of Achieving the Dream and had a strong partnership with a data solutions company. And so he looked at what impacts student success. And where they were looking for correlation to begin with was with subject. Um, so maybe math is harder for some students than English. And so all the students were dropping out um, of one of those courses. Or maybe it was the specific course. Um, so we all know um, that biology 241 and 242, those anatomy and physiology classes for nursing and other uh, allied health students are really challenging. So they looked at that. They looked at the time of day. Um, do students have to get here super early, run into traffic, and they're having issues with that? Um, if it's in the evening, are they typically more non-traditional students? And they're struggling as well. They looked at rigor. Um, and so I'm not, like, I think this fell under a little bit of the biology 241, 242 compared to a course that's traditionally seen as um, not as rigorous. And then the last one, which I think is really interesting because we talk about it so much um, when we're thinking about why our students struggle, is the idea of student preparedness. So they looked at um, previous grades in high school, if they had that available, and placement uh, assessment in terms of measuring preparedness. And what they found was a little bit shocking, both to Don and to those of us listening, 
is that none of those things showed a significant correlation to students staying in a course and successfully completing it. So they were looking at the course level. I think that's also important to mention. So then um, Don decided that he was going to um, interview his faculty and find out what their teaching methods were. Did they lecture primarily? Were they practicing a flipped model? Did they use a lot of group work? That sort of thing. And again, very interestingly and somewhat soul crushingly to me, um, the answer was no. They did not find in their data a correlation between student success, again, defined at the course level um, and the specific teaching method that an instructor was using. And that was, um, as someone who does professional development and has invested a lot of time and effort um, and tears and thought and a lot of myself into helping teachers to be stronger teachers, um, I was a little bit discouraged when that was his result. And then what he shared was that his findings in interviewing the teachers who had the highest student success within a course, so they had the least number of students who withdrew and the most students who successfully passed the class, they showed a common thread of connectivity to their students. And this was the fundamental difference that he discovered that had a significant uh, correlation with student success. And I found, you know, in my moment of gloom that my career had been built on something that maybe wasn't as important, I realized here's something that I can support, that I can get on board with, and that I can support faculty members in doing, and that's building relationships with their students. So we wanted to further kind of parse this out because Maybe some of you are hearing this and saying, oh, that's lovely and nice and a little bit fluffy. And so he wanted to know what specifically they were doing, what um, practices they'd put in place to create this connectivity. Um, and I think I'm missing a slide. Sorry about that. So the four connections um, were the four things that he found. And so I will go ahead and let you know those. And if you actually want to open your handout, um, Alyssa, if you don't mind sharing that link, we can use that to reference. Um, so what he found is that the faculty members who'd intentionally built connection with their students did four things consistently. And those are the headings in that handout that Alyssa shared there. And the first is that they interact with students by name. They learn their students' names within the first week and begin using them and use them throughout the quarter, use them in emails, use them in the LMS. So instead of just leaving a comment, um, stating the student's name first, things like that. They also check in with their students regularly. Um, Elliot Stern, who's our vice president at Lake Washington, says be your own early alert system. Yay, thanks, Melissa. And so, what we found there is that those who pay attention to their students' behavior, track that, um, and give them feedback regularly and promptly, have students have more success. And the other part of this that I really appreciated, because sometimes it was a thing I would forget as an instructor, is that I also um, needed to say things like, hey, we really missed you yesterday. Um, we're really glad that you're here. And or things like, what did you do this weekend? That sort of thing is a check-in regularly. So it doesn't necessarily just have to be academic. All right. And then we have schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings. So this is proven to be one of the harder ones here at Lake Washington. I'll talk about that in a bit. But this is the idea of at the beginning of the quarter and throughout the quarter, um, scheduling required one-on-one -on -one meetings with students. And I kind of want to pause from my overview and go into a specific really quickly. That required part of the meeting we found to be really important. Um, up until this point, students, if they've had to go to their teacher's office or stay before or, or stay late or come early to class, they've typically had to do so because they were in trouble. And so making that a requirement and an expectation for all students reduces the stigma and increases the use of office hours um, or those kind of one-on-one -on -one times you really want. And then um, the next one is practice paradox. And we actually just talked about this one today in our learning community that's related to these. And that one is essentially 
I'm going to use exactly Don's words because I love the Texas version of it. Um, it's set high and clear expectations and then be a reasonable human being when things come up in your students' lives. And that one, I would say, of all three, is the least concrete and the most individually determined. So what practicing paradox looks like for you beyond setting the really clear expectations up front um, with that flexibility, that's really up to each individual instructor. So that is the four connections. Those are the four things that Odessa College discovered when they looked more deeply into what the most effective instructors were doing. So what they asked folks to do was to commit for one quarter to practicing all four of the connections. I want to be very clear and transparent. Odessa is in Texas, and it's a right to work state. And by invitation, they meant everyone will do this for one quarter and see how it goes, and then you can decide. So everyone was required to practice the four connections for a quarter. Almost three years later, everyone is still practicing all four connections. And part of the reason why is that in-class retention, so that's specifically what they were looking at, which is do students stay, do they not drop or withdraw, and then do they successfully complete. Before faculty started practicing the four connections, was at 83%. Afterwards, 95% of students were retained within a course across the college. So the really important thing to note about this, and I think the really exciting thing, is that this percentage was regardless of gender, age, race, or ethnicity, or Pell status. This is unheard of. As much as we've tried with all of our interventions related to completion, we've seen everyone improve, which is fantastic. But we haven't seen those gaps close between students of certain genders, ages, races or ethnicities, or socioeconomic status um, within programs. And so if you kind of think of a bar graph moving up together and that gap not closing is how I picture it. So with the four connections, it actually eliminated what we've called equity or opportunity gaps. Um, so that is mind blowing. And it's all based on what I'm hoping are not revolutionary practices to you that these are things as instructors or as administrators that you see practiced or practice yourself on a daily basis. Um, and they're just things we can be more intentional about. So that makes that really exciting. OK. All right, so really quick, I have two stories I want to share from Lake Washington, and then we'll have a chance to discuss a little bit um, what you're already doing, if you'd like to share that, um, or ideas that you have. OK. So, at Lake Washington, um, we heard about this and introduced it as part of a training that I did on working with first generation to college students who we studied through our TRIO program. Um, we did a qualitative interview based study that the results were students sought um, special support through TRIO because they wanted really good information about being successful in college and they wanted a meaningful relationship with someone who could help them navigate college. And so we were talking to faculty about that and how the four connections can help them facilitate those meaningful relationships with students. We invited people um, to sign up and 24 people pledged to practice the four connections um, and receive data back about the difference that it made in their classes. One of the people who signed up was our, one of our culinary arts instructors, an adjunct instructor um, who teaches costing and menu planning. Now, if you're someone who enjoys cooking, um, if you can use the little hand icon on the left to raise your hand. So if you're someone who really enjoys cooking or baking, um, you can use the hand icon. Awesome. Great. Yay, my cooks. Come, I'm like, come cook for me. <laughs> Analea, yep, I'm with you. All right. So if you, of those people who enjoy cooking, you can go ahead and lower your hand now. Excellent. Thank you. And then of those people, raise your hand if you enjoy cooking because planning the budget and making sure you have all the inventory you need is the best part of cooking. All right, 
I will let the side one speak for itself. Okay. So what we are, um, what Matt, the instructor, was discovering is that in this class, students were having a hard time because it's a rigorous and complex course, right? They're having to do a lot of math and planning and uh, critical thinking and decision making. But they're also um, not coming into the culinary program looking forward to a, cl a class that's focused on those areas. And so his uh, rates of completion of the course were really low. This was extra concerning to him because this course is required for both the certificate and the degree. And the students were not coming back and taking the class again. And so they also were not completing the certificate or degree for the program. So Matt implemented all four of the four connections. As an adjunct faculty member, he does not have um, paid time for office hours, so he volunteered his time to do the one-on-one -on -one meetings. He enhanced the design of his course and each of his assignments to be much clearer. And then he offered a lot more support um, personally and in conjunction with our drop-in tutoring. And the result that he saw is pretty phenomenal. It is just for one quarter, um, but we're really excited about it. And he's definitely convinced that this is worth doing. So the average for the three prior quarters for his class for course completion um, were 77%. So we looked at everything, drop, withdraw, and then did they get a 2.0 or better, which is what's required in our courses. And after he implemented them, 100% of his students successfully completed the course. He did not change the rigor of the course. He just started practicing the four connections. And the part of it um, that was really impactful for him is that those students also, he saw a boost in their confidence to be successful in the rest of the program. So it didn't just have an impact on this course in particular. It really fundamentally changed the way the students thought about their own abilities. So yay, so exciting. All right. Yeah. Wow. Yay. Thanks, Alyssa. OK. And then um, what I didn't think about when we first started practicing the four connections was the faculty success aspect of it. In December, I had a conversation with Jennifer Wetham um, from the State Board. I think you all can still it's hear working. me, right? I had a weird message come up. OK, awesome. Thank you. Um, from the State Board. And she suggested that I consider making a faculty learning community for the faculty who signed up for the four connections. And so we decided to do that. And at our first meeting, I asked the question, why did you sign up for this? totally voluntary. We're basically going to give you data about the success of your classes. Like it doesn't, it's cool and interesting and uh, had good results at Odessa, but what really motivated you? And I had a lot of really good feedback about wanting to ensure student success. Um, what I didn't expect is that um, besides the faculty member quoted here, a number of faculty members said that they signed up because they saw this as an opportunity to re-energize their work as teachers. And that was really moving to me um, to see that our faculty members um, maybe were a little bit worn out. Um, shocking, right? Were worn out. And that building relationships with their students was the solution they were seeking um, to that experience. And I thought that was really meaningful. So we focused a lot um, in our faculty learning community on mentoring one another, building our skills around the four connections, and just spending a lot of time sharing what's going on in our lives and with our students and how the four connections are going. All right. So now I'd like to give you time to reflect on your classes um, currently or in the past or the faculty members who you serve at your college and things that you've seen them already do. Um, that they could improve further are things that you might want to invite them to do um, as part of this process. All right, so Alyssa's posted the link to the handout. And I'd like to give you, even though it will cause dead air, and I'm thinking of my radio DJ in the morning being like, oh gosh, it's the worst. Um, I'd like to give you just a few minutes of kind of quiet reflection on the content of the handout. And if you are having any trouble viewing the handout or accessing it, um, I believe we'll be able to post it here. And then um, you can also let me know in the chat, and I can send you um, another version, perhaps. OK. All right. Sally, 
I went ahead and pulled it up on screen share too, just so you had it in front of you. Awesome. And I am seeing uh, yeah, a couple gray that'll boxes. That'll go away and just for it. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so go ahead and take about 30 more seconds to scan um, where you're at. And then um, I have a couple more examples that I want to share that aren't listed on the handout, and then a couple polling questions for you all. And then we'll have lots of time for questions, like the one uh, that was just asked. So just about 30 more seconds. All right. So the goal of the four connections is not to be completely overwhelming, nor to be revolutionary. I mentioned that. I'm like, this is not the most revolutionary webinar that you will have ever attended. Um, these are not new or shockingly good ideas. They're probably things many of you did as instructors, and many of you see in uh, the work that your instructors do. It's the combination of the four and the intentionality behind them um, that makes them powerful. And so one of the things that came up while you all were reflecting is what if it takes me longer than a week to learn names? Uh, I think that that is just fine. I think that's kind of the expectation they set at Odessa specifically. Um, it's kind of, you know, get started going. But also, um, really showing that intentionality behind trying to learn your students' names um, creates the same response in people is what we're starting to see at Lake Washington. And so what we've started doing is, and again, nothing revolutionary, um, we started asking the students to introduce themselves on the first day of class. That way we can get the phonetic pronunciation of their names written down in our roles. Um, that way we can kind of make sure if there's something they prefer to be called, that they get to choose that and introduce themselves as that. We've also, as mentioned, by Cheryl, great idea, having students create um, paper name tags. We've been using all those old file folders that nobody uses anymore because everybody uses the cool little electronic ones on the computer. We've been hacking those up and uh, giving them to students to create a name tag that they can then bring back and forth to class or the instructor hangs on to for each class. Um, so that's been really successful. The other thing I want to know about the students' names and about the four connections in general that we've been talking a lot about is how do we also encourage students to participate in them? Because we know peer relationships within the class are really important. And so anything that you do to learn your students' names should also be something that helps the students learn each other's names. Um, and so again, the name tags have been really helpful for that. Um, also using Canvas profiles for online classes and encouraging students to get those updated and include a picture as they feel comfortable. And then also um, doing introductions um, so that students can kind of get to know something fun about each other. So on the first day of class, I ask students to share an activity they're good at and enjoy doing. The second day, I ask the same question, but it has to be a different activity. 
And on the third day, I ask them to share some, an accomplishment they're proud of. So I kind of build the level of sharing through those. All right, and I see a few comments um, in the bottom. So I'm going to check those out really quick. Make this nice and big so I can read the whole thing. Yes, Jared, good points. All right, so Jared mentioned um, the emotional cost of caring about others as humans. Um, and so some, that is terrifying, <laughs> to be quite frank, and can be exhausting. And so I totally appreciate the note about knowing campus support services. So my background, um, I was a life coach for at risk youth for a short amount of time and have done a lot of work as an advisor, specifically in TRIO. I have a degree in psychology. And I am very aware of the limits of my um, professional training in that regard. Um, I'm not a licensed counselor. And we talk a lot about scope of practice with faculty and how the support services are here for them um, in terms of being able to work with students on issues that are beyond their scope of practice. Um, nice. And I love the idea of dropping the lowest score from the assignment group um, and then out being flexible. Cool. Nice. Excellent. So if something went wrong at home or on the assignment, no problem. That is a really awesome approach, Jared, and I appreciate you sharing immense, uh, immensely. Great. And then um, Ana, I'm just going to skip slides because this is what we're doing. Um, Analea has um, starts the first few minutes of her course on the first day asking students to write down their definition of success. And she shows Brené Brown's vulnerability TED Talk and then they complete an assignment on how they will try to be vulnerable, share their definition of success, and then tell me how they think I can contribute to that definition. Wow, that's awesome. If you have not seen Brené Brown's uh, TED Talk on vulnerability, it is amazing. And what an introduction to a class, right? And you're essentially setting the tone that it's OK in this class to try, um, to learn and grow, and part of that process is it doesn't always go the way that you expect it to. And that's huge in creating trust with our students, which is a lot of what the four connections are about. Thanks for the link, Analea. That's awesome. Um, did anyone have an idea they'd like to share um, that this sparked for them that they might start doing or encourage someone else to start doing? see some typing. While uh, you're typing your response, I will share one thing that was surprising to me when we started this at Lake Washington. So the group of faculty I mentioned, there are about 24 who signed up at the beginning of the year just to practice them and get data back, um, were representative of our faculty body in a way that no volunteer group had ever been um, in the time that I've been here, at least. And so. The group who signed up is about half adjunct, half full time, half professional, technical, half academic, um, a really representative spread of brand new to teaching to I've been here for 30 years. And one of the people on that end of the spectrum who I consider someone I look up to greatly and I uh, seek advice from. Um, she signed up because she wanted to be better at practicing paradox specifically, um, but she also mentioned that she wanted to continually improve her practice even towards the end of her career. And I found that humility and vulnerability, to use that word we talked about, really inspiring. And one of the really practical things that she did she'd never done before is she decided to check in regularly with her students who are doing really well. So sometimes the unfortunate, I mean, it's always unfortunate when a student withdraws from a class. Um, that's our goal is to keep that from happening um, as much as possible. And so what can be frustrating as an instructor is when one of your best students just disappears um, and you don't know what happened to them. And oftentimes it's because we do a lot more checking in with those who are struggling than those who are successful. So she sent a personal email to the students who were doing particularly well in her classes. Really short, just I noticed um, the time and effort you're putting into your work. She picked for each student uh, two things that she specifically wanted to call out and encourage them to continue doing. 
and the responses she got back to those emails were some of the most meaningful that she's ever gotten from students. And a lot of them referenced, you know, you're the first one who's ever really noticed me. Um, so it's been really interesting. That was a new practice for her um, to try it that way and see the difference in those students. That was really exciting. Yay. Um, all right, so we have an addition from Analea. She shared the four connections with her EVP, and he is trying uh, to get on this call. Um, OK, but we are very interested in moving this forward. So that is a good um, quick plug that I can give. We have, with our faculty learning community at Lake Washington, created a Canvas course that's open to anyone. Um, it acts more like a repository or a website than an interactive course. And you can pull all the resources that I've referenced today. You can get the handouts. Um, you can get a ton of things. And Alyssa just shared that. And it will be on the screen shortly as well. So just as we conclude, I have two uh, polling questions for you, um, just to kind of you know, pique my curiosity and see uh, which of the four connections do you already practice regularly and well? And you do have to pick one. Sorry, I should have said all of the above. <laughs> Excellent. Jared's got the names. That's great. Monolite's got Paradox. That's awesome. That's the one we keep talking about. Or no, sorry. Also, check in regularly. No, I'm bad at, I'm like dyslexia, no. Mary's got A, Anne's got A, great. Great. All right, so it looks like interacting with students by name and practicing paradox. That's what I hear typically. A lot of people will be doing A, B, and D, so um, three of the four, and that scheduling the one-on-one -on -one meetings is something new for a lot of people. Um, I will say about scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's hugely successful, but make sure they're really focused um, and that you have a question you ask students in advance um, or have the students think of a question they want to ask you in advance and give them a topic maybe to talk with you about and then schedule just um, 10 or 15 minutes to start with um, where that kind of line of counselor teacher blurred for some of our folks as they were scheduling hour-long meetings and that a took up a lot of their time, and B meant that they were so exhausted they couldn't invest in this throughout the quarter, which is really the goal, is the consistency, consistency throughout the quarter, and building trust in your availability um, and openness as a teacher. So scheduling those one-on-one -on -one meetings, having it structured around something you want to interact with the students about is, is a good thing. OK, and then uh, last question. Which of the four connections will you begin practicing more intentionally? Great. Great. Thank you all. Um, I did want to mention, I know that I'm in my last one second. Um, I presented this at an adjunct faculty training that our HR director was attending. And she mentioned to me, wow, this is really something all of, um, all of us in HR should be doing with employees at the college. And so I noticed perfect timing, Earl. I try my best to do all of these with my faculty and student clients. And I think that's huge. We all desire meaningful relationship with other human beings, and it facilitates our success in learning as employees and students. And that's hugely important um, at our colleges so that there are places that you know, we want to show up to work at every day, and we can transfer that um, connectivity to our students. And so it's not just for faculty. Um, it really extends within the group that you supervise um, and those that you interact with. 
Yay, Jared, good comment. Yes, a dean who practiced these with faculty would be an effective and loved dean. Yeah, that's excellent. I was speaking, um, I got to present on these at Renton Technical College last week. I think it was only last week now. Yep. And the vice president of instruction there came up to me afterwards and talked about how important these are for him to practice um, with his faculty. And the idea that they really do promote um, trust. And especially that practicing paradox, the first one, the clear and consistent um, expectations, and really being able to check in regularly, get back to people on time, those are huge uh, for building that trust so that students can come to you when they do have issues, um, employees can come to you when they have issues, and feel welcomed and supported. So yeah, good, good points. Yay. All right, so here is that last website again, um, and you are more than welcome to use whatever is posted there. Under each of the four, um, you'll notice there the best way to navigate it as a guest is to go to modules. So if you're familiar with Canvas, it works similarly to a course. And there's a start here module where you can use, thanks Alyssa, uh, where you can use, um, Sorry, I got distracted by Earl's comment that his chancellor does this, which is awesome. Uh, OK, so as a guest, it's best to go to modules and then click on the Start Here module. And then you'll be able to read the white paper about Odessa College and see kind of some of the differences and similarities and how they use it. And then these first two resources, Brief Intro and Applying the Four Connections, um, those are just really good ways to share information about the four connections with other people. So the applying the four connections is the same handout that you've got today. And then the brief intro just has the four on it, like that slide that we were looking at that describes each one. And then you can see some specific to LW Tech work under presentations. I'll add what we did today. So that will be there. You'll see an Ignis one. And then um, each module after that talks more extensively about each of the four connections, and some of them have a lot of additional resources available for you. So that you can find a way to practice these um, in the most meaningful way for you. Because the truth is, with relationships um, and students and employees, right, think of yourself, um, if we don't find an authentic way to connect with other people, our students will read it as BS. Um, and it'll diminish what we're trying to do. So this is all here so that you can own this for yourself um, in a way that's meaningful for you and your students. All right. Any last questions from anyone? We still have quite a bit of time left. So um, we have at least five minutes for conversation or questions. So if you want to do any more tours of the classroom or anything else, Sally, please feel free because you do have us some extra time. But we can also end early, too. OK, cool. Um, I'm trying to think. If there aren't any, oh, I see some typing, so I'll wait for those. And I can't see the chat while I'm screen sharing, so I will hand that over to you and Mark, OK? Yeah, just let okay. me know if you need Great. me to navigate anywhere in particular, or if you want to talk about anything specific in your class, and I'll bring it up for you, since I'm the one with the screen share going. OK. Yes, thank you, Earl. These are great reminders of how to build success around relationships. Um, Anna, I have been working on meeting with students during lab, not formal. Do you think that is on the right track, or should it be in the office? So we have, um, we're primarily a technical college, and uh, our machining instructor, who's been running the program forever, signed up for the Four Connections. And he has been practicing the one-on-one -on -one meetings within his lab time, and it's been really successful. Um, so I would say using him as a model, that seems to be working really well. I think it's more just making sure you have that time um, to give each individual student attention so that nobody's lost um, within the class, as can happen when we don't intentionally practice that. Great question. Thank you, Anna. Great. 
All right. I don't see any other typing, so we will I'll just we'll hand it over All to you, right. Alyssa. Let me just yeah. get us back to our slides. And um, feel free to put any additional questions into uh, the chat as I'm closing us out. And um, we'll go from there. All right, so there's Sally's ending slide, thanking you all for being here today. I thank you as well. And just to um, let you know, um, oh, I have the wrong date on here, darn it. Um, that should be May 18th. My apologies for that. Thursday, May 18th is our next webinar. And um, it's tips for making online learning opportunities accessible to all students. And that happens to also coincide with um, Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So um, please join us in about three weeks for that. And um, as promised, here's um, my contact information and Mark's contact information should you have any questions after the webinar ends. Also a reminder that you can find uh, the recordings and the schedule on the ATL blog. And um, again, we thank you for joining us today. We thank Sally for um, sharing her expertise. Um, this is a very um, thought-provoking webinar. And um, like she said, not necessarily revolutionary, but I think it's a really fantastic way to revisit things that um, we may have forgotten to do in our teaching career. So um, thank you, Sally, for the reminder and for sharing. Um, this information with us because um, it's a good call to, to arms to, you know, dig back in and um, really get connected with students. So um, thank you again. And um, just also to let you know, all of our Ignis content is um, Creative Commons licensed. So feel free to take it and use it and uh, redistribute, share, um, however you'd like. Um, any final comments, uh, Sally or Mark? Just a big thank you. I really enjoyed sharing with you all and really good ideas and feedback and gave me a lot to think about, which is one of the reasons I love facilitating. Yeah, some really great comments in the chat, too. So yeah, excellent sharing today. Mark, anything? Nope, just want to thank everyone for attending today. All right. I'm going to go ahead and turn our recording off. We're wrapping up just a few minutes early today. Um, but but I think that the time that we did spend here was very well spent. And again, thanks, everyone.